Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to the Lunch Learn Link seminar. Uh, we are co-sponsoring this seminar with Epidemiology, the Summer Institute, and uh, and so we're doubly pleased to have uh, all of the summer students in the audience too. So uh, Moises Sklo will actually introduce our speaker for the day. Thank you. Is this working? Right. Is this working? Yeah. Can you hear? Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Patty Gravit. I've known Patty for, for quite a long time, right? because she was a PhD student in our department, and she finished in 2002. So that's already 17 years, yeah. incredible. So Dr. Gravit is really uh, sort of unique in the epidemiology world, because she really is very comfortable with molecular biology and epidemiological methods. And for many years, actually for eight years, she worked as a molecular biologist. And uh, she led the development of a gold standard HPV genotyping assay that is currently marketed by Roche. So she, she, she is really had bridges molecular biology, epidemiology, and now she's very interested in implementation science, which is a terribly important field from the public health uh, viewpoint. She's a leader in HPV research. And uh, she is interested in, in the role of viral latency in reactivation in the context of immune compromise, so people who have other diseases associated with HPV, like HIV, parasitic infections, and so on and so forth. So it's very, uh, I'm very happy to introduce her, and I'm sure you enjoy the, uh, the lecture. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay mm -hmm. with this one? Perfect. Um, I don't know if I need to turn that off or not. So as uh, Dr. Sklow said, um, you know, my, my history has been that of bridging basic molecular biology with epidemiology to really elucidate more mechanisms and natural history of disease. Um, but I will say I've been accused many times in my life of not staying in my lane. Um, <laughs> I fundamentally believe that if you're a scientist, you can learn new things throughout your career. Um, maybe after this talk, if you're a true implementation researcher, you will, you will doubt whether this is true. But, um, you know, I've moved with the problem, right? So my expertise has really moved from molecular biology of understanding is HPV actually a cause of cervical cancer? I started this in the late 1980s. Then we used epidemiologic methods coupled with uh, good molecular biologic um, exposure methods to show and, and establish causality. And then very rapidly after that, we just developed more and more interventions to control the disease. And so what happened, though, is that a lot of these interventions, and particularly those that are involved in better screening for cervical cancer, are not being readily adopted in the places that need it the most. And so. Trying to address that issue became a real interest for me, and that was what led to the talk that I'm gonna to give today. I have quite a lot of slides. I'm gonna to try to go through some of them really quickly, just to give you an example, but I wanna set some, um, some background for you. So what I'm gonna talk about today is a methodology or an implementation research model that we have kind of over the past two and a half years with my team in Peru have really developed as something that we think of as an integrative model, which integrates systems thinking and systems practice with more traditional frameworks of implementation research. And I think of this as a way to operationalize problem solving and implementation. And so this is very new. Um, this is just the basic core of the model. It's modeled after systems thinking and systems practice, where you go from understanding the system to finding leverage in the system to make change, acting strategically on the leverage points that you've identified, and then learning and adapting post-implementation to see what happens and to continue to adapt and um, move forward. And this is just to give you a framework of what I'm going to be presenting for the rest of the talk, but I'll go through each of these steps and how we arrived at this. So it starts with the general you know, 
problem situation, right? So the problem is a horrible disparity geographically in the burden of invasive cervical cancer. And you can just see on this slide where you have Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of South and Central America, parts of Southeast Asia, and a little bit in the Eastern European countries, you know, cervical cancer incidence rates greater than 20 per 100,000. I mean, we have over half a million women per year with an incidence of cervical cancer, and with population aging, that burden is just getting higher and higher and higher. Um, However, what you all are probably aware of is where there's not a high burden of cervical cancer, it's usually because it's been effectively controlled. Not that the population's at least risk, it's just that we've been able to intervene through early detection and treatment of precancers to prevent the incidence of mortality from cervical cancer. Sadly, those technologies, which are largely based on pap smear screening and colposcopy, biopsy, and excisional therapy, have not translated to the parts of the world where you still see this very high burden of cervical cancer. So this is the problem. The WHO has recently had calls to action. How many of you are aware of the calls of action for the elimination of cervical cancer? Yeah. So rarely do we talk about elimination from the World Health Organization for a non-communicable disease. Um, although HP, HPV-associated cervical cancer is to, at some degree communicable. And we have now a highly effective prophylactic vaccine, which if deployed with 90% coverage um, in the global population, and that's all you did to control cervical cancer, we believe that we'll reach the elimination target, which is less than four per 100,000 incidents of cervical cancer by 2120. So um, more than a century away from being able to do that. What you can see in this graph is that modeling studies have shown that you can significantly accelerate reaching this elimina elimination target by, by many years if you combine the intensive vaccination with, invasive, with intensive screening and vaccination with a target of 70% screening coverage of women 35 and 45 years old and 90% treatment of all women who were defined who needed it. So these are pretty... Um, ambitious targets, I would say, because they're looking at getting the 70% screening coverage and 90% treatment worldwide by 2030. That's in a decade. We've had available screening systems that have worked to reduce the cervical cancer burden in the Western world for 40 years. So there's an issue that needs to be addressed. If we're going to reach this accelerated elimination target, by adding screening to mass vaccination, we're really gonna have to come up with better ways to screen and implement the technologies that we have. So achieving this is gonna require, according to the WHO's draft uh, elimination plan, sufficient affordable supply of optimal screen and treat tests and other medical devices. There's a lot of focus on HPV testing as the primary means of screening. The samples can be collected by the women herself. Doesn't require a speculum exam. They can either be mass tested or they're point of care tests. And then screen and treat strategies would say, rather than sending everybody for complex diagnostic triage, just treat the infections with ablative therapy where eligible. And then you have done a lot um, with the virologic and the disease cure in that treatment of about 90%. Um, the second one is to identify innovative and optimal screening service delivery models for increased quality and coverage in different contexts. So all I can say is right now we clearly don't have these. Very few of these uh, places that are often high middle income countries have actually successfully deployed screening in a way that actually reduced the cervical cancer incidence. You need tiered and integrated testing networks. Not clear to me at all how we're going to do that. You need to ensure high quality of testing in a sustainable way. You need to ensure that uh, nations scale up nationally, both the screening and treatment programs. That requires a lot of political will and coordination. And you need to create a demand for the HPV testing. Currently, the HPV tests are practically unaffordable for most low and middle income countries. It's believed with high demand, not only will you get higher screening coverage, but the price points will come down through uh, mass negotiation. 
So where does that put us right now? Well, on the translational research uh, pipeline, we've done the basic research that I've talked about before. We've actually got a strong evidence based that HPV-based testing through self-sampling is a highly sensitive method for the detection of um, people who are at high risk of precancer and cancer development, and that ablative therapy, as I just told you, treating all the HPV positives will result in about 90% virologic cure and cure of any existing pre-existing precancer. These are strategies that are meant to address some of the complications of the more uh, difficult and complex pap smear screening programs. So we know what to do. Now we're really in this T2 translational phase of how do we actually get people to do it. The guidelines have been developed. Meta-analyses, cost-effective analyses, systematic <coughs> reviews are all published for at least five to 10 years and are widely available and have directly addressed the issues in the context in low and middle income countries. What we need now is a broad scale adoption of these strategies. And then the big question is, how are we gonna do that, right? This was not in my lane. I had no idea how to tell people how to do this. I was involved in proving that HPV testing would work, that it would work with self samples, we proved that it was a better screening test for the identification of precancer than digital inspection with acetic acid or PAP screening program, particularly when you're employing those in low middle income settings. I'd done all of this work, right? But it was really frustrating to continue to go work with our colleagues. And I've, I've been spent two years in Malaysia, you know, highly developed country, um, not screening anyone at all practically spent uh, two years working in uh, Iquitos in Peru with, with several colleagues, some of which are, are here, um, screening ineffective, but definitely possible and feasible. And so I really started thinking, how can we find strategies that increase the adoption? So what tools can we bring to the implementation challenge? And this is where I stepped out of my lane and I had absolutely no idea, so I had to go and learn. And as I said before, even if you're as old as me, you can still learn new things. So I started looking into talking to some of my friends who you know, were trained as implementation researchers. Implementation science, when I graduated um, in the Department of Epidemiology in 2002, was not something that we ever heard about. Um, so this is a relatively new area, um, very confused in, in many ways, but they, they you know, sent me to, well, you need to look at the frameworks. There are lots of frameworks. Think about how you use the frameworks to design your implementation strategy for increasing the adoption and sustainable use of cervical cancer screening uh, programs. So one of those strategies, or the frameworks was the health system framework. We found this to be very useful and that it helped us to identify kind of all of the different you know, sectors of health systems that would be involved in screening that were potential targets for intervention to improve the adoption and the sustainability. What it doesn't really tell you as a framework is how are you going to effectively engage across all of those health system domains? I know that I should think about them, but how do I make sure that I understand what they're thinking and what I'm going to do to have them change? I also wanted to understand how do they interact with each other, and the framework itself doesn't really say too much about that. The next framework, this is a very, very um, popular framework in implementation research, it's the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. It kind of does, goes a little bit farther than the health systems. It talks about inner settings. This would be kind of at a clinic level where the services are actually delivered. The outer settings, which are things like the community and regulatory bodies and the finances and government structures that are going to interact and regulate what's happening on the individual, um, the inner setting, clinic setting. It talks about the individuals who are involved in each setting. And for each of these domains, tells you things that are going to be relevant from past experience and having an intervention, a health intervention actually be adopted and sustained over time talks about characteristics of the intervention itself that are relevant to how well 
the implementation of that intervention is going to, again, be adopted and sustained. And then it starts to give you a process for how to go about doing this, right? So you plan, you engage, you execute, you reflect and evaluate. And again, we found this to um, be important to group the considerations that were relevant in each health system domain that we had looked at before. I think it helped to identify potential targets for the intervention or the implementation by thinking about where, what kind of behaviors or what type of system could be targeted to change in order to increase the adoption. And it puts forward at least some actionable process for implementation research. What we found a bit frustrating is, okay, I understand theoretically everything that this framework tells me. I don't know how to use it. You know, what do I do with it? How do I actually take all of that theory and go into a situation and change the system to be something more to what I want it to be? So that was the limitation that we found. And this is something that I um, copied from work that I'm doing um, separately with Dr. Uh, Projecta Sewell from the National Cancer Institute. She's been doing a postdoctoral fellowship in the dissemination and implementation group there. And this is just to help you understand, when we try to look at this, those CIFR domains and specify them as they relate to cervical cancer screening in a low and middle income country, Projecta trained and lived in India, so she's got a very good understanding of what those look like in India. And I've worked um, in India, Malaysia, and Peru pretty extensively. And so what you can start to see is there's a lot of elements that are going to be involved and will have to be coordinated in order to actually have the screening program show a health effect, which is the reduced incidence and mortality from cervical cancer. So this started to have us understand the complexity of the problem we were facing. And then we found the knowledge to action cycle. This is an implementation framework that we started to say, OK, well, now it's telling me what I need to do. Not just theoretical reasons and things to consider when you're thinking about implementation, but what do I actually do? And the knowledge to action cycle kind of takes the center funnel, which is all the work that we as researchers have done, the knowledge generation, and then start to funnel it out into practice, identifying problems, determining the no-do gap, identifying and reviewing selective knowledge, and then adaptation, selection of interventions, action, and sustainability. So we found this to be a bit more helpful, but again, it suggested, and because it did suggest a detailed process for implementation, it gave you some specific series of steps that should be taken in some sequence, so that was helpful. But again, we felt like, okay, this is telling me what I need to do, but not giving me a lot of information on how will I accomplish each of these cycle steps. Um, it was unclear how you would apply this to very complex problems that will show you kind of characterize cervical cancer screening programs. And then one of the things that we have found from our pilot work and over the last two and a half years working very closely with the health systems in Peru is importantly, this doesn't tell you where this knowledge source comes from. And we think one of the key things in implementation research, particularly when you're doing global health implementation, is you need to understand whether the knowledge that you're using and acting on is externally or internally derived. So does everybody, anybody know or can tell me what externally derived versus internally derived knowledge, how to differentiate those? I was going to ask you. <laughs> So externally derived knowledge is the knowledge you'd get from the literature, from content experts, from outside of your system, outside of the place where you're trying to implement a new health intervention. Internally derived knowledge is that that's derived locally, that the health system themselves derives. And there's a combination of both of these, but as I'm gonna point out, Internally derived knowledge, particularly when you're working in international health, is essential. And I'm gonna just put it plainly, people don't like for somebody to outside to come in and say, I know better than you and here's what you should do. They just, you know, nobody wants to be told this. I don't wanna to be told that, right? And so understanding the key importance 
of using externally derived knowledge in concert with internally derived knowledge, particularly about system function and context, is critical, in my opinion, of successful and sustainable implementation. So, but this still didn't get quite there for us. We still kind of had questions about, well, if I want to go and translate WHO approved cervical cancer screening programs with HPV screen and treat strategies as they identify an elimination plan to a place that's currently not doing that. They're trying to do PAP-based screening like we've been doing in the US for years and just not succeeding. How do I identify the problem? Where is the problem? Is there only one problem? Does everybody agree that that's the problems that we identify are the ones that are the most important and the ones that are best to act on? Often what we externally derived <laughs> experts will say is it's the technology. Replace PAP with HPV testing. Replace LEAP or excisional therapy, which requires surgery and hospital care with ablative therapy, which can be done at a primary health care level. Use portable uh, thermoablative devices rather than non-portable or gas-based uh, devices really focused on the technologies, right? And what I'm going to try to come across to you is that technologies are an important, but only a small part of why things don't translate, of why innovation doesn't translate. And I want to tell you what we highlight. And then there was a the problem of, well, how do I define what strategies I'm supposed to use to make this change, to implement these new technologies? This is just an example. My colleague, um, who's the co-principal investigator of this project with me, Valerie Pasteldan, she's, uh, she's Peruvian, trained in the United States. And before I even knew her, she had already conducted a fairly scoping um, review of infrastructural barriers to, to PAP-based cervical cancer screening in Peru. And I'm not going to take the time to go through this, but what you can see is there were all kinds of places that things were falling through the cracks that was leading to the continued high incidence of cervical cancer. So it comes back to, how do I identify the problem? There are a lot of them, right? Does just changing to an HPV test solve all of this? I, you know, I question that. The other kind of concerns that we had just about this particular framework is, you know, it says to adapt the knowledge to the local context. Well, what process do you use to adapt that strategy? How, how do I do that? I don't know how to do that. Who decides how to adapt it? Is that, again, an externally derived decision? Is that something I go in, take a look at the situation, and then I say, here's what I think you should do? Or is that something that the health system themselves helps me to decide? How is the local context defined? How do I know what the context is in order to adapt to it? I, I just didn't see the roadmap for these things. What are the implementation strategies I should be using, and how do I decide which ones to use? And I put this slide up not to have you read it, but in the implementation science literature, these are 73 discrete, identified, validated implementation strategies. Okay? So, you know, an example, make billing easier. Right? So that's an implementation strategy that probably works in a lot of situations when you're trying to implement in the United States. Mandate change, right? So that's showing that the outer setting has an important you know, implementation role. They need to say this needs to happen for it to happen. Um, develop education materials. Uh, model and simulate change. Identify early adopters. There's a lot of things you can do. Well, which ones am I supposed to use, right? So there was a lot of just operationalization of this whole area that I was a bit perplexed by. And that's what motivated us to develop what we call the INSPIRE model. And so the motivation for INSPIRE is that we, we believed and we really loved these conceptual and theoretical frameworks. They were very helpful and useful in guiding our thinking. But we found them to give very little guidance on how we use them. Where do we start? This is research, not theory. What kind of research methods can I employ to get at the implementation, adoption, and sustainability that I'm seeking? 
right? So I couldn't really figure out how to do this. And so what we kind of decided after working for about a year with the health systems in Iquitos, a couple of key points and key principles really emerged that I think guided most of how we ended up translating our implementation problem to, um, to this particular setting and development of the INSPIRE model. So the first is we fundamentally believe that the interventions that were externally derived will not be sustainably adopted, right? Because you go in and immediately talk to the, the authorities, you talk to the Ministry of Health, you talk to the regional authorities, you talk to the local doctors. They immediately tell you what you're saying is wrong, it won't work here, we don't like it, that's not what we're told, that's not what we were trained to do. You get pushback constantly at every level. And quite frankly, this is gonna be especially true for international implementation because and I, one of our champions and our very dear colleagues is actually here, Graciela Mesa. And I think Graciela will confirm that when we first started speaking with her about this, when we had the concept of doing this implementation project within her health system, there was a skepticism. So, okay, fine, you've got this grant, you'll come for five years, you'll do something, what happens to us when you leave, right? It's the typical helicopter science that people really are unfortunately, you know, not immune to. I mean, this is what happens in many of these contexts. You come in as an external person and this is gonna be the response you get. You, we really had to work hard, and I'm hoping that Graciela will, will tell you that we were successful in proving that this was not our intention. Our intention was to help solve a problem. That's it. And so having an internally derived problem-solving process we thought was critical. How did we accomplish this? We used another of the uh, implementation research frameworks, that's the participatory action framework, which again, I have no time to go into in detail, but what it really does is it sustainable implementation requires the adoption that's locally adapted, appropriate, acceptable, feasible, and cost effective to deliver. Those are th that's part of the WHO kind of um, mandates of how you're going to get 90% screening coverage and or 70% screening coverage and 90% treatment. We believe knowing how to meet this requirement is impossible. You cannot know this if you don't have continuous stakeholder engagement locally. You just cannot go in as an outsider and believe you're going to meet that target. So we fundamentally believe participatory action research was essential and a core part of the INSPIRE methodology. We also realized in, in looking at this and mapping things out, what we're looking at in terms of cervical cancer screening implementation, this is a complex problem. This is not a simple problem. This is not a complicated problem. You can't just give somebody a recipe and say, follow this and it will work, right? And I'll explain why. To that end, and I have um, been criticized as a molecular epidemiologist and now I get criticized as an implementation scientist, I feel like the time for reductionist thinking has passed. We have distilled things down to their component parts and done about as much with that, I think, as we can. And I feel as research scientists moving forward into the 21st century, we have to find ways that embrace and accept the complexity and don't try to reduce it down. Things are more than a sum of their parts. That is not easy. I don't have the answers. But I'm really working hard, both in the molecular epi world as well as in the implementation science world, to figure out how to embrace this complexity and not try to ignore it. It's there. So um, if, you, if you do a reductionist approach, if I just take one of those implementation strategies and I test it in one place and I don't use it in another place and I compare, do I think that's going to result in any kind of sustainable implementation? I'll get a research paper. But I will not sustain cervical cancer screening in the areas I want to. I'm 100% certain of that. So what are the alternatives to the kind of typical RCT type approaches where we evaluate implementation? This is just showing you if we start mapping the things that the WHO has said were necessary in order to meet the screening and treatment targets, 
and how they map out to the health systems framework, you can get an idea of the incredible complexity that we're talking about and the different numbers of people and institutions that have to be involved in this. And so what this led us to was uh, a systems thinking approach. So how many of you are familiar with the concept of systems thinking? Three. Okay, go home and Google it. When I started talking to this, I, I have a very dear friend who's also uh, an MPH graduate of this school, who's now the uh, health director in Arlington County um, at the public health, Arlington County Public Health, Department of Public Health. And when I was talking to him about this, this problem, he said, look into systems thinking. I also have never heard of it, and I'm now a huge fan. So what is system thinking? Fundamentally, systems thinking is you know, systemic. It's other relating to a whole system. It's trying to make sense of the whole rather than just describing the parts. And it really fits well into this uh, metaphor, the, the six blind men and the elephant, right? which is essentially a reductionist approach to, I hear this thing out in the you know, jungle. What is it? I can't see it. And somebody you know, touches a leg, somebody touches here, somebody touches the trunk, somebody's touching an ear, and they're all mentally imagining very different things, even though the system that they're trying to understand is exactly the same, right? So this is a very good, you know, long-standing um, parable to help you understand why the reductionist approach is going to lead you often in divergent and not necessarily helpful directions. And one quote that I really use a lot when I'm talking about systems thinking is, we really have to be able to keep the big in mind when we can only handle the small. So we understand our limitations. But again, you cannot shy away from complexity when complexity is part of the problem you're trying to solve. You just can't make it go away. right? So systems thinking is fundamentally a problem-solving approach. Importantly, it targets problem situations in a complex adaptive system, which we believe is what cervical cancer screening represents. And here, and this is very important, the goal of systems thinking is to move system behavior from what currently is, which is I'm screening and not making a dent in cervical cancer incidents, to what it ought to be, which is I ought to be screening and cervical cancer rates go down and few women, fewer women die. Right? Importantly, in a complex systems, the systems thinking will say the best you can do is to your goal is to improve on a problem situation not solve a problem. So we're really targeting a different outcome. Um, it, it both identifies the problem situation and it localizes it within the system. Where is the problem behaving and how is it localized with respect to other parts of the system operation? And then it finds leverage opportunities where you can intervene and improve the situation. So again, no time to go into this, but there's a whole literature on this as well. Right? So systems praxis framework integrates kind of um, hard system methods, which are things that you might be more familiar with, um, simulation models, agent-based models, discrete event simulation models, with soft systems methods, which I will explain later. And there's all kinds of theories and foundations, and this is a very interdisciplinary area, kind of emerging out of the uh, kind of general systems theory and cybernetics um, back in the mid 20th century. So what are the, some of the key characteristics of systems thinking? Well, systems thinker is going to think about interconnectedness rather than uh, disconnection. They're going to be more circular and holistic in thinking rather than linear thinking. They're going to look at emergence, um, things that naturally come together to unexpected outcomes rather than trying to bottle things up and keep them in silos. They're going to think of the whole rather than the parts. They're going to um, think about synthesis of the information rather than just analysis of the situation. And very importantly, they think about the relationships and how the relationships, rather than just the isolation of different parts, factor into system behavior. 
System behavior then is modeled as the action effect and feedback um, through a series of feedback loops. So this is really showing you that the interaction between the system elements is critical because it's going to, sometimes you can find good leverage so that you get a reinforcing event, but then you have to also be cognizant of certain interventions and change will have a balancing effect and that, could, that needs to be mitigated. So thinking about systems, you have to define what a system is. It's essentially constituted as elements that make up parts um, of the whole. And these can be agency, actors, stakeholder, institutions, and the perspectives of each. The links between the parts, so the processes and interrelationships, and the boundaries that define the system. And just quickly, this is kind of a cartoon model of you know, kind of authorities and regulations defining what's happening in communities and primary health centers and different levels of care for cervical cancer screening. And it's just showing the elements that are involved, the links and interrelationships in terms of how people travel through the system, particularly the patient needing to be screened. And then it kind of, you can think about how do you define your, your boundaries? Are you only looking at the tertiary care level or are you talking about the whole system and how it connects? This is just showing the same thing, but rather than looking at how the patient flows, we're looking at how information flows, which is a key element when you're talking about linking across continuums of care. And then for each of the elements in the system, we have to think about how they're viewing the system and the system behavior, their perspectives. <coughs> so the perspectives are the key part of SAW systems methodology, and this is the key part of doing systems thinking when you're trying to do this kind of implementation research. What are the different ways the system or a situation could be understood? How will the different perspectives affect the judgment or the success of the intervention? And how will people's understanding of the situation affect their behavior? And how will that affect the behavior of the system? Right? These are the things that I think don't get enough attention. People who adopt health interventions have agency. They can do or not do what they're supposed to to make a system work. They can follow or not follow the recipe, and you can't control that. And so you really need to understand these perspectives so that you can understand how to adapt an intervention that meets the criteria of people doing what they should. And so we do this through the use of SAW systems methodology. This is work that was done by Checkland. It's an action-oriented process of inquiry into problem situations where users learn their way from finding out about the situation to taking action to improve it. Learning emerges via an organized process, which we hope to show you is the INSPIRE process, in which the situation is explored using a set of models of purposeful action as intellectual devices or tools to inform and structure discussion about a situation and how it might be improved. So how did we take all of this background and develop it into our INSPIRE model? Again, here's our model. Start at the core of it is constant participatory action research with the people who are either influencing or involved in delivery of a screening through understanding the system, finding leverage to move something from what is to what we want it to be, acting on that leverage, and then learning to see how did it work and how can we continue to adapt. The hub is a set of research methods that are foundationally the soft systems methodology. We, we're fundamentally trying to engage our, our stakeholders in the system and understand their perspectives so that we know what can be moved and what's flexible and what's not, because we have to design the system around those realities. Implementation frameworks that we use are the CIFR, and then it turns out this is all the implementation strategies I'll tell you about um, as they map to Inspire were things that after we had already developed the Inspire and done two and a half years of research, I learned about these discrete implementation strategies and can tell you that so many of them we did intuitively because we felt we couldn't get to our participatory process without some of what other people considered to be discrete implementation. So building buy-in, developing relationships. So the first step is define the problem situation. Every time we have group stakeholder meetings, we frame this problem. 
Here's our current as is situation. This is the invasive cervical cancer rates by age in Peru, South America total, and the world. Is that gap acceptable? Right? Everyone uniformly agrees when we meet that this is not acceptable. And so when personal perspectives and self-interest creep into conversations and problem-solving conversations, we bring it back to this. Is what you're saying or what you're arguing going to help reduce this gap? And that helps to reframe and, and get everyone back to the problem situation solving goal. We identified and engaged stakeholders across multiple levels, as you can see. We got broad stakeholder enga engagement. We informed local opinion leaders. We attained many, many formal cooperation agreements, um, which we still do. <laughs> We consent to ongoing participatory engagement in the screening program design. Our stakeholders signed consent forms at the very beginning that they would be part of this process. We debunk the myth of helicopter science in our context. And as researchers, we try to make it very clear we're facilitators, we're consultants, we're technical assistants with a goal to create a learning environment for the stakeholders to solve their problem. So phase one, understanding the system. Um, the research methods that we use to understand the system, to define what the as-is situation is, is a series of mental models, which I'll describe. We use an alignment, influence, and interest matrix where we map all of our stakeholders with how interested they are in solving the problem, how aligned they are with our potential process and our solutions or the group's solutions, and how influential are they in actually having the change implemented? And again, that just constantly sets a reality of what we can change and what we can work with and what we have to work around. We use uh, strategic assumption servicing and testing, which I'll describe. We audit the current system outcomes so that we know what's actually happening. And then we visually represent those through pathway analyses. We use the CIFR and the Health Systems Framework to do this. And then we have several of the implementation strategies actually kind of fit very nicely within this understanding the system phase of INSPIRE. Mental models are critical. This is something that you would be amazed. This is a mental model that we made as researchers of the screening system. You know, screening, you have a target population with a few people who have pre-cancer who need to be identified and treated. Um, not all of them will get screened. So that's one key element. How many did get screened? You then have a primary screening to sort out high risk from low risk. That's all dependent on how well your screening test works. How many of those who test positive and should be triaged to a diagnostic uh, evaluation actually go to the diagnostic evaluation, so participation? How good is that diagnostic test? How good is it in your hands? Um, of those who had positive diagnostic testing, how many of them who required treatment actually received treatment? And how effective was the treatment? It's very important, very few people, often what happens in ministries, they have their quality indicators or how many people got screened and how many tested positive. And that's it, right? So this is something we pull out we carry it around with us we pull it out at the ministry of health we pull it out all the time to say you can't reduce cervical cancer incidence till you get here anything that doesn't work along that pathway will result in failure so it's again complex so how do we do this we did it through qualitative assessment of screening operations where we basically took that mental model and said how does this happen for different stakeholders. Um, the purpose, I, I'm going to skip through for time on the strategic assumption surfacing. We involve the community in, in doing these things, um, gave some interviews to understand knowledge. And we did qualitative evaluation, so we understood quali qualitatively how the system works, and then quantitatively what the system was doing in terms of preventing cervical precancer. And what you can see is here are the number of people who are positive by either PAT-based screening or visual inspection-based screening, and then where they drop off, right? So very few people who screened positive actually ended up getting treatment. 
Here we can also tell you the time that it took to get from one point in that continuum of care to another. And you can see that it can take up to um, you know, 40 days in some situations to get from the primary screen to the next level of care. And then importantly, in the soft systems methodology and the systems thinking methodology is we triangulated all of those data to make the system visible to our stakeholders so that they could engage in a dialectic discussion about the system influences. And we did this in a variety of ways. One was the kind of flowchart schematic. This is how complex their systems actually were. This is an example of a woman who needs to go to the hospital level, and you can just follow the blue arrows across different sectors of healthcare and see how many places and how many back and forth pathways the woman has to take in order to get treatment. It was amazing. So as a result of having this dialectic discussion, showing the shared visual, here are some examples of the things we learned. One of which, which kind of struck me is that I, I felt that there was still a misconception that the screening program was meant to identify asymptomatic cancers. It wasn't really meant to identify precancer and treat that. That was, you know, that's a fundamental mental model I would never have considered had we not done this kind of research. We found fragmentation, redundancies in screening, low coverage, huge disconnects between what happened at the primary level in the hospital, high burden placed on the woman. This continues to be a real problem that's rarely discussed, and it's an issue of dual practice. So often doctors in these health systems have both private practice and practice in the public system, and that creates a lot of competing self-interests that are often economically motivated. And that has incredible emergent effects on how well a public health system operates. There are many competing self-interest, um, lack of empathy, and then a high turnover of health authorities at the national and regional levels, which makes sustainability questionable. So then we find leverage using the research methods. We bring those individual perspectives now back together in the room to, to look at those visual mental models and dialectically discuss. Um, we do scenario analyses and again, some implementation strategies. We did this through a series of design workshops where we interactively worked to, uh, to go through these shared visual models. Again, identify where there were delays. This is where we localized the problem situations, found delays, redundancies, fragmentation, and lack of standardization that were all identified as potential problems in the system. We then looked at problem solving, where can we change, guided by some boundaries. This was the National Cervical Cancer Guidelines uh, from Peru. So whatever we did had to fit within those regulatory frameworks. And then we developed a model. So we simulated different strategies and, and places we could change using something we call the Cervical Cancer System Impact Filtering Tool. It's an Excel-based simulation model. We have it publicly available if anybody's interested. What it does is compares different screening scenario and enumerates each scenario's impact on the amount of cancer prevented, each scenario's impact of how many resources would be needed at what level, and where in the system the breakdowns are occurring in any given scenario that lead to missed opportunities for prevention. Right, so essentially we're trying to isolate which of these purple boxes are contributing to the failures in any scenario. Important thing about using the scenario analysis is what we get pushed back from the national level often is that we can't deliver lower quality care to the poor. We have to be able to have a system that gives the highest quality evidence-based care to everyone. Same screening to everyone. And this is a, a huge issue and it really comes down to if you give exactly the same thing, you're gonna have equality, but because of all of the contextual dependent forces, you're going to have low equity and actually an opportunity for cancer prevention. And so the scenario analysis tool helps to show us that if we use the standard of care, we're preventing less than 1% of cancers within you know, assumptions that are based on what we've saw the system operation. If we change to a different strategy, we could increase that to about 70%. These are guided then with any choice that you have, not only is looking at the impact, but how acceptable is that choice? How likely is it to be adopted? How feasible will it be to do? Can we do it the way it's supposed to be done? How much will it cost, et cetera? So at the end of these design workshops, this is our working group for the design workshops. 
They selected a strategy that simplified the overall screening process. They would screen with HPV positives, allowing for self-sampling so that they could increase the reach. The women who were HPV positive would go directly to a primary center for evaluation for ablative treatment. If they were eligible, they got treated. If they were ineligible, which would be about 10%, would be referred to the hospital. And it cut out a lot of process that we had identified. And this was what was determined to be the highest leverage solution for this um, sector. So that's kind of what we've done. And now we're in phase three, which is acting strategically, where we're using working groups, again, self-assistance methodology, key informant interviews. And clearly, this phase, the acting phase, is what most implementation scientists think about. Not so much the understanding, not so much the shared leverage finding, but just what do I do? Because these are the implementation strategies we're using in the acting phase. So we um, are doing stakeholder design implementation plans. We facilitate working groups so the stakeholders basically create these uh, operational plans that say, here's how we're going to deliver the strategy, who will do it. We develop training materials. We've developed an automatic registry system so that we can do routine monitoring and evaluation to assist in phase four, which is learning and adapting. We develop counseling materials for the women that are based on the focus groups that we did um, earlier on in the understanding phase, which you can see multiple ones of these. And we've installed the infrastructure that was needed for the HPV-based testing. And then finally, phase four is the learning and adapting phase, which we haven't started. We'll be using these research methods, um, which will include the implementation framework re-aim. And essentially, this is going to be a learning collaborative. So as we monitor every three months after we've implemented their new strategy, we will you know, meet with our stakeholder group and present our uh, implementation outcome data and our qualitative information about how the system is now working and again, lead dialectic discussions of does anything need to change and we modify in real time. So it's really kind of a rapid cycle of mixed methods research. And this is just to show you our mixed methods um, re-aim, which is a very standard implementation evaluation tool. And to end, I just want to talk about the notes on the INSPIRE methodology, because this is something that we've kind of developed out of in our mind's necessity. The many discrete implementation strategies, it turns out, we used, and they were essential, we thought, to move the what is screening to the what ought to be. And so we're actually asking the question, can this INSPIRE methodology actually, in and of itself, be an implementation strategy? Can the whole package be considered an implementation strategy? A lot of the pushback we get is that we're not monitoring individual behavior responses to what we're doing. We very much fear that a constant measurement of stakeholder response to our strategies will fatigue them and at risk losing their, their collaboration, which we think is essential. So we propose instead forensic assessment of the strategies. So after we're done, actually going through and listing out what we've done as part of the implementation process and have stakeholders scale, that wasn't useful or I don't even remember it to, no, that was critical, that this wouldn't have worked if we hadn't done this. And if we standardly do that across multiple implementation projects using INSPIRE, I think commonalities will start to surface in the literature and, and things like meta-analysis and systematic reviews. The INSPIRE methodology itself is generalizability, not the outcomes of our project. What we're doing is adapting to a local situation. It's contextually dependent. It sounds like it's a very complex project to operate, but I just want to say we've accomplished everything that I showed you, which was in very rapid lack of detail, in two and a half years, and at any given time, our research team had no more than 10 people involved, most of whom were very young and not particularly well trained in epidemiology or qualitative research methods. Um, again, for Inspire to work, stakeholder engagement and readiness to change is essential. If you don't start with this, you, you Inspire probably would fail. So I know I went very quickly through, but it is a complex issue. And I just want to end by acknowledging our funding source, which is the National Cancer Institute, and all of our collaborators locally and internationally. And I do want to point out particularly Gracia La Mesa, who in Iquitos has been 
really the person who's made sure that we understand what's going on in the health system there, and Valerie Paz Saldan, who is my co-PI from Tulane University, who lives and works in Lima. And I may not have left any time for questions, but thank you so much for your attention.